All right, I see the recording started. So I'll go ahead and share my quick slides. All right. So welcome, everybody. This is our regular Southwest Florida SEC meetup that we have monthly on the third Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Now, regularly, we meet physically in a building at 239 Work, or 239 Works. I never remember if it's plural. Uh, it is a shared workspace here in Bonita Springs. I am located in Naples currently, uh, but we're fairly close enough that we could just say it's Naples. I'm sure the Bonita Springs people will kick me for that one, but... Um, Anyways, uh, we, like I said, we meet monthly. What happens is we're trying to raise InfoSec and CyberSec uh, awareness in the community uh, by providing a, a forum for people to ask questions, learn, network, um, potentially even get hired if they're not already in the, in, in the InfoSec and CyberSec uh, industry, uh, just, and just provide a, a, a place to, to meet and, and just talk. Uh, we're very informal. Uh, generally, we do round table uh, with question and answer or, or just talk about various topics that we're interested in or a project that we might be working on. And then occasionally we get lucky and we have people like Samantha, who's going to be our speaker tonight, uh, come in and give us a presentation, uh, which we've been lucky enough the last couple months to, to get presentations. So that's been really well and, and it's uh, driven more interest too. So we hope to continue reaching out into the community and, and keep building that awareness. And, and with that said, we've got several other tech groups here in the community. Uh, that we're all working together to promote each other and promote community as well. Uh, so some of those are Southwest Florida Coders, uh, WordPress Meetup Southwest Florida, uh, OWASP Bonita Springs, which I also run, and that's the first Tuesday of each month, Southwest Florida Regional Technology Partnership, Pi Ladies Southwest Florida, which is teaching Python for women, and Southwest Florida Data Meetup, which Daniel uh, runs that one. And Daniel, since you're here, uh, if you could give a quick blurb, and if, if anybody else is here from any of these groups, uh, feel free to jump in after Daniel, too, so we can get a quick blurb on each group. Sure. Thanks, Mike. So I'll make it quick. Um, so we had to, uh, our, our speaker for May 4th, which is our upcoming meeting, had to reschedule. So I'm trying to finalize uh, who our speaker is going to be. It's looking like it's going to be a, a chief data scientist from a healthcare startup, and we're going to be talking about uh, machine learning uh, general topics. Uh, this meetup is really about uh, database technologies, data visualizations, machine learning, and everything related to data. Uh, so yeah, check us out on meetup and feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, is there anybody else here from any of these groups? Hi, I'm Desi. Hey, Desi. Uh Hi, everybody. I am fairly new to um, Southwest Coders. And so um, thank you, Mike, for advertising your presentation today. This is very nice. But yeah, um, I'm, I live in Southwest Florida. I just completed a boot camp uh, with the University of Central Florida. So that is the reason why I, you know, went out searching for group meetups for developers and I found Southwest Florida Coders. So They've been really great. Perfect, thank you. All right, so if there's nobody else here, we'll go ahead and continue on. All right, so upcoming events. We have a few. Uh, Citrix Sec Meetup is meeting tomorrow night, April 22nd at 7 p.m. Don't have the times here, sorry. Uh, they are doing... Uh, um, I think interview and resume workshop and their meetup. Uh, Sarasota InfoSec, John, I know you're here. I'll let you quickly talk about that one. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, this, or, uh, that's pretty much just a, a virtual happy hour. There's, there's not a security thing we're doing, but we're just getting together and uh, inviting people who are in the group or people outside of the group to, to meet up and discuss and talk all things security. Great, thanks, John. All right, and I, I, I'm sure everybody didn't know I would be putting, everybody who's joined tonight, I'm gonna be putting on the spot. Oh, nobody dropped, that's great. Uh, just, just kidding. So, <laughs> uh, Hack Miami Meetup is this weekend on April 25th. There'll be present, two presentations, one on ham radio, one on Mimikatz. Uh, there's Intro Sec Con, which is a virtual conference from 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern. 
uh, Saturday, April 25th. Southwest Florida Coders Code Collab, the resume workshop, is going to be on Tuesday, April 28th. Southwest Florida Data Meetup, as you heard from Daniel, is going to be May 4th. And then OWASP Bonita Springs is going to be on May 5th. All right, uh, Samantha is going to be giving our presentation tonight. So here's a little bit of bio, uh, biography about her. I don't know, Samantha, if you want to just go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, introduce ILF as well, or if you want to give, give that part to Shane, it doesn't matter. Either one of you is fine. No, I can do, I can do both. Um, so hi, my name is Samantha. Um, I made a journey from tea to tech. And by that, I mean, I literally worked at a tea store before I started any of this. Um, I also went to school on the side to be a pharmacy technician. I got my license and it was so monotonous <laughs> and I just liked tech a lot more. So that's when I started my adventure into the security industry. Um, so I made a Twitter and we all know and love InfoSec Twitter. Um, and that's where I learned about WISP or Women in Security and Privacy. And if you don't know them, they're a phenomenal group that promote women uh, in security and privacy and they gave me a scholarship to go to DEF CON. And that was two years ago, and that is where I actually met ILF. Um, so ILF is the Innocent Lives Foundation. It was founded by Chris Hadnagy. Um, he's a fairly prolific name in the InfoSec community. If you don't know him, I highly recommend checking out his books. Um, so I started volunteering with ILF and over time, I, well, now I'm their full-time PIT coordinator. So PIT is Predator Identification Team. Um, so I lead a team of about 20 volunteer investigators, and we assist law enforcement in tracking and locating child predators who think that they can hide online. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my general introduction. Perfect, thank you, Samantha. All right, I'm going to go ahead and unshare the slides here, and then I'll turn it over to you for your presentation. Perfect. Let me, as I drown in browser tabs, perfect. Share, move me like this. Ah. Now, done, present. All right, so this is Discovering OSINT, the good, the bad, and the scary. And trust me, it gets pretty scary pretty fast. I'm gonna skip this slide because we already went over that. So for those of you who don't know what OSINT is, it stands for Open Source Intelligence. Um, it's defined as data collected from publicly available sources to be used in an intelligence context. So it's much deeper than just Googling stuff. OSINT is an entire world of data. So you have your address, your license plate, places of employment, what you like and post on social media, groups you may be a part of. But deeper than that, there's aspects like exploring metadata, EXIF data, domain data, data breaches, property records. It just goes so deep and I'm not gonna have time to cover probably even the surface of OSINT today, but it'll give you a good idea um, and I'll supply some of my favorite learning resources at the end, but I'm gonna try to not focus as much on tools. Um, so who cares about OSINT or who should care? So investigators care for starters, um, both private or if you're like me and work for a nonprofit. Government agencies care. Pen testers are a huge one that care. Um, that's one of the first steps in a pen test is reconnaissance. Um, ad companies, that's how they target ads. Uh, parents, parents should care. If you don't, you should definitely look into it, uh, not only for just verifying like who your kids are hanging out with, but looking into what schools that you want to link them to or new events that may be good for them or understanding how to secure your kids on the Internet. So don't take pictures where your address is in the background, stuff like that. Um, aside from that, malicious attackers are the big one. So social engineers, hackers, pen testers also looking at you, um, but they do it from an actual paid uh, perspective under scope. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, you will also care about OSINT because uh, it really can be used in your day-to-day -day life. So what do people put out there? This is observational OSINT. Now, why, why do I care about badges? Well, what do you see in these badges? I've got first and last names. I have where they work. I have the, the company logos. I have, let's see, in this one, it tells me her exact position with the company. If 
But even further than that, it tells me how your badges are built. So cloning badges is really, really easy and it's not expensive at all, um, unless you're starting to embed like RFID chips into it, which that's a whole nother talk. Um, but if it's just a simple piece of plastic like this, I can easily clone that and put the logo on whatever I want. So Tyler is a particularly interesting one because not only does she show me her entire badge, but in the comments on typical Thai things, she tells me exactly where she works, uh, A23N at Methodist, exactly what unit she works in, and that she's been there for over a year and that she's pretty comfortable with it. So it's not a huge change for her. Um, this would be really good for a social engineering attack. I would pretend like I may know her and I could be like, oh yeah, she started the position like a year ago. Um, it's really easy to leverage things like that. Uh, some more observational OSINT. What about this? What do bumper stickers tell you? Bumper stickers are an amazing source of OSINT. So let's take a look at the picture on the left. What do we think about this guy? So first off, they're from Louisiana. I honestly thought the license plate said Arizona at first, but they have LSU on there. They have the French Quarter, which is very popular in New Orleans. They're fans of the Green Bay Packers. Now, what about the Star Wars one right here? That is a husband and a wife and two kids. So I know now their family size and I know their interests. I know generally where they live. And if I look at the front of this, if they live in an apartment, a lot of people put apartment stickers there as well. Um, that can help you track where they live. Now, what about the one on the top right? Why would I care about this one? It's kind of a mess. Well, if you look at the stickers and the content of them, you can guess an age range of this person. Why? Well, I, I'm guessing not a lot of 40 plus year olds are going to be putting DGK or Dirty Ghetto Kids and a bunch of skater stickers all over their van. Um, so you can guess that this is probably about in their, obviously old enough to drive, but probably not more than 25 years old. Um, you also know that they're a Star Trek fan, you know that they're from Texas, the first three letters of their license plate. Um, it tells you a lot when you just stop and really observe things. Now, what about the picture below it? Well, same thing. Boston Strong and big old letters right there. So you know what they're interested in. They're proud to be an American. Um, anything on their cars, aside from their license plate, you can build off that really easily, especially if they have unique stickers that you can go look into. Perhaps they have like a local Little League sticker. Then you can go investigate what team that is and then narrow it down from there. So OSINT can get really dangerous really quick, but it's also really fun. Um, and all these people made it really easy for me. So this, you can go on Instagram and search new job, who dis, new badge, new passport, work badge. And the biggest new one we're seeing because of COVID-19 is work from home. Um, so all of these people who post this, they will show you their badges, which include first and last name. They will show you passports that are valid with nothing blurred out on them. And they will show you their computer screen and the work from home. Now, why do I care about a computer screen? Pen testers know that probably right off the bat. You can see what operating system they're using. You can typically see what email service that they're using. Um, you can see what apps they may have on there and you can really leverage things from there depending on what you're doing. Um, but before you get into all that, and now that you have the right mindset of observational OSINT, you want to know how to structure it. So before diving into tools, think about your end goal. What info do you need? Do you need to find a way to communicate with the person? Do you need PII information? What are you looking for? Now, the best thing for this, I think, is the OSINT framework. Um, it was developed by Justin Nordine. This is what I use for everything. It was my Bible when I was learning all of this. So let's see if it'll let me share. Can you guys see that? Perfect. All right, so this is the OSINT framework. It goes over so much that I am not going to be able to go over today. So you should definitely take this down, spend some time going through it, because when you click a username, it branches out even more. Do you want to look through specific sites? Or do you want to look for a general search engine that will just see anything that's out there? It'll also tell you if you need to download a tool, register for it, 
things like that. Um, so it's also great for archives, metadata, and some of the harder things that it's kind of hard to get started on those. Um, it even gives you stuff for encoding and decoding. So it's a really, really powerful tool. Um, I'm not gonna go too deep into this today just because that would be the whole presentation. So going back over, you want to structure your OSINT so you don't look like this. Um, why don't you want to look like this? Well, aside from the obvious reasons, this will give, this will lack credibility if you come across disorganized. So your client or your friends even, they'll start looking at you like you're crazy and not want to follow and they will instantly lose interest. So you want to make sure that you set your goals and you set your structure for it and you go from there. Now, each investigation will typically be different, or if you're just doing it for fun, there's a lot of avenues that you can go down. OSINT is really easy to get sucked down rabbit holes, um, which is why the OSINT framework is so important. Um, now, Google dorks are another thing. This is known as Google hacking. Google likes to give you information that it thinks you want, but it really sucks at giving you the information that you actually need. So it's defined as search strings that use advanced search operators to find information. Google makes it difficult to find certain things through normal queries, but if you can piece together your own strings, it makes things really easier. So you can use it to find passports, insecure login pages, insecure cameras, or if you use it day to day like me for just life things, you can get to places on websites quicker. So these are some examples of Google dorks or search operators. In URL that will search Google first. You can put your you can put your keyword right there, and it will search in URL cats. It will show me everything on Google that has cats in the URL. Same with file type. Why would I want to look for like an XLS or a PDF? Well, XLS a lot of the times can have uh, financial information on it and payroll things, so you can narrow it down from there. Same thing with in text and site. Site allows you to search within that website, but not Google. So it's not gonna give you a whole list of 5,000 plus. Um, like my example down here, I wanted a new computer chair. Um, mine is just crappy and I wanted to look for a really nice one. And I knew the general pattern that I wanted, but I hate how the website is laid out and I didn't wanna go and look for it. So you can do site secretlab.co in text, Dead mouse. Now I put the quotations over it to search specifically for that word. Now you can type a sentence, you can leave the quotations out. However, it will really narrow things down if you leave the quotations in. Now what this did is it searched the website, Secret Lab, and it gave me back everything that contains the word dead mouse. And from there, I was literally first link, I was able to just click and open my chair. And it was great. So you can think, use it for not only pen testing, but really day-to-day -day stuff as well. Continuing on, um, the, it really gets complex really easily. So let's go take a look at the Google Hacking Database. This is where things really get complicated and you can actually piece together your own and if you find things, you can submit this. So people use Google Dorks also to search for vulnerabilities in certain websites. Um, people use it to find cameras that may be open or login portals or in this one. This one will actually bring up CCTVs. And it'll bring up an index of them. Now that's 17,000 and you could get more and more specific and really keep building on your string if you want to. Now the one I did was the in title network camera, in text, pan and tilt, in URL, viewer frame. So I wanna look for a website or an index that has network camera in the title, it has pan and tilt in it, and in the URL it's gonna have viewer frame, so I know that I'm the one looking at the camera. And it pulled up a thousand results. All of these, if you click on them, will take you to unsecured cameras. Now this is fair game, it's not illegal unless you log into something. Now that is where things, you don't wanna do that, you just don't. Um, but this is fair game, there's no password, nothing is set telling us that we cannot go in there, so it is absolutely open source. 
Um, when I said I could find passports, I was not joking. This one is in title index of in URL passport. Let me exit out of full screen. And let's just go see what that gives us aside from my small pictures. Perfect. These are all passports. Now I can go through. This guy was active. That's the one I actually have back over here. And his doesn't expire until 2025. So these are all active passports. And you can search indexes of them. Be careful where you're clicking. Make sure you're not going to some sketchy website. Uh, but if you just hover over, you can typically see. Going back. Perfect. So let's talk breach data now. Full disclaimer, I am not a lawyer. <laughs> we, we started to dabble in some of the scarier things, um, but I, I don't condone illegal activity and what you do with this information is on you. Um, breach data is typically illegal. Some countries, I think it's illegal depending on what you are doing with the breach data, but you will have to check in your country. What is not, or what is not legal is taking the information from that breach data and going and logging into accounts. So again, don't do that. What information is generally leaked? Well, that's login information, so passwords and usernames and emails. PII information, so your social security information or health records, things like that. Sometimes IP addresses, and then even more severe ones as we've seen a lot is payment information. Um, I think we all see the data breaches all over the news all the time. Um, so where to even begin with data breaches? Well, I like to go to Have I Been Pwned? And if you haven't been to this site, it's a fun spot that you can actually go check. Have you been pwned? Have you shown up in a data breach? This is the main hub for data breaches. You can also make it set up alerts to where it will alert you if you actually do have your email come up in a breach or if you want to search uh, for specific news articles about said breach. Um, it's constantly updated and keeping tabs on new things. I think last week it was, yeah, last week an independent Android store had 20 million users breached with full information. Guess who had the info? Have I been pwned? This gives you a whole new insight into accounts other, uh, other accounts your targets might have. So if you look here, I use my old email from well, my first email, so don't judge me on it, but it was darkrose630, and I showed up in, I think it was eight breaches. And not only does it tell me what those breaches are, but it tells me how those breaches happen. So I showed up in the MySpace one, the Neopets one, now they're just random ones like that, and it tells you the exact time and how it happened. Um, so then I can take this and go, oh, my target had an account on MySpace. Let me go look in archive data, see if it's still there, things like that. Um, aside from have I been pwned, this is where things get really scary. Now this is a more complex tool that I learned from Nick Ferno's class and it is absolutely phenomenal. It is a dark web tool, but if you put .ws at the end of it like I have, you can use it on the open web as well. So when you go to it, you can't see that. Here's where I'm hoping the demo gods are on my side. So far they're not, it's not letting me click the page. What about this one? I already did it. Okay, so I typed in my email from when I was like 11, again, don't judge me, and then press go. You can look for similar ones if you want or similar um, domains. So if you're looking for this username, but say you want Yahoo, Gmail, Hotmail, any of them. Then you go down here and it gives me all the passwords that I had when I was like 12. That is scary. Even scarier than that, I can go over here and do six feet under, which was the password. And if it loads, maybe, yes, it will tell me all the email addresses that use that password. And this list goes on and on and on. Now this is great not only from a pen testing and OSINT perspective, but also from a privacy perspective. 
So you can use this to check against yourself and go look at data that you want removed or things that you need to go try to clean up. Um, so it's, it's really powerful and it doesn't do anything that's not shown up in breach data yet. So it's not just like going and finding your password. Um, but that's by far one of my favorites. What about websites? Websites have much more OSINT to provide than what's just on the surface. So not only is there domaintools.com, so you can look in who is data and you can actually see who registered the website, uh, who it's registered through, like is it Cloudflare, is it GoDaddy, so forth. Deeper than that though, there's robots.txt. Robots.txt is, an, it's, websites create this file to tell Google basically to not let spiders crawl things on this page. It allows websites to block portions of the site and it also tells an OSINT investigator what the website doesn't want you to see. So what do I do? First thing I have a website, I go check the robots.txt. Now I didn't want to show an insecure website, so I just went to seattle.gov. Um, this was one I've done previously. Um, so basically they're telling me they don't want me to see any of this. So they don't want me to view scripts, um, they don't want me to view archives, any of this. But that doesn't mean that you can't access it. Literally all you have to do is delete the robots.txt part of your URL and put in uh, whatever's after disallow. So for example, instead of being robots.txt after seattle.gov, I put directory. because I wanted to see what is in the directory that they're not wanting to be crawled. Um, you might be able to reach that part of a site unless they've configured it to block you out, which most government websites like login pages, uh, you'd think they show up on the robots.txt insecure, but when you click them, they'll 404 out if they're configured correctly. Um, so this is continued looking into the directory of seattle.gov. It gives me a nice pretty page to view all the departments and search last names. It also gives me their email, and first and last name. So now I have an email, I have a new username right here, uh, calandra.childers, and I have much uh, phone number and a department to explore. Um, looking for, I didn't wanna dox her because doxing is a very, very, very serious offense. Um, but through this, I was able to find her Twitter page and through her Twitter page, she likes to post pictures of her home. What's the bad thing about posting pictures of your home? Well, from an attack vector, I now know the layout of your windows and I can possibly see the numbers on your, in the photo on your address. Um, you can really, in about 10 minutes, build a whole profile on this to work from and then just crawl out from there and look into family members, friends of friends, what posts do they like? Um, it's really powerful. With all that being said, and with everything I've taught you through this, with knowledge comes power and with power comes responsibility. So you never know what you're gonna find on a target. Um, it's usually much more than you think is out there. And a lot of the times it can leave you with the power to potentially make or break someone. And doxing is incredibly serious. This shouldn't be done lightly. So think about who you're giving this data to and think about what you're doing with this data because it can, people mess with others just for fun. Um, so posting things on websites, I, as from an ethics standpoint, I do not support public doxing whatsoever. And Samantha, for those who are on here, can you explain what doxing is? Yeah, absolutely. So doxing is basically everything that I've been teaching you here is finding personal information. So I take a username and then tell you, here's your address, here's your phone number, Here's your friends, here's your first and last name, here's your place of employment. And this is often seen in, in our community and we see it all the time. We also see people doing it to their exes. There's been many famous sites and revenge pornography sites where this happens. Um, and it's, it's a very serious form of harassment. So you would say doxing is taking all this information and posting it publicly? Yes, okay. um, not even just publicly, so I guess, more into my role with ILF. My job basically is to dox pedophiles. So I look and I take their username and I find what other usernames they have, their email addresses, phone numbers, 
but I don't publicly post that. I give it to law enforcement um, very privately, but it's still doxing. So the, the gathering and providing to someone of that information is doxing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a little more into uh, resources. I know I didn't cover a lot of tools. Um, I actually didn't know how much time we'd have available and there's so much to OSINT that it would feel unfair to just kind of, here's this, skip, here's this, skip. So um, if any of you want to screen cap it or if you want me to copy and paste it somewhere, these are some of my absolute favorite books and tools. So Vinnie Troya just came out with a new book, Hunting Cyber Criminals. And that has been my all time favorite uh, read lately. So you can actually look into investigating cryptocurrency and much deeper levels of doxing and dark web OSINT. Um, the OSINT framework, you can spend hours and hours and hours going through that and there's still always something to learn. Um, APSE, that's what really set me in line with a lot of this and gave me my confidence with OSINT. Um, that's put on by Chris Hadnagy, my boss, shameless plug, it's an amazing class. Um, but that's the Advanced Practical Social Engineering. For those of you that are familiar with Trace Labs, they're an amazing group to be a part of. Um, I haven't done a lot of work with them, but it's always recommended and I'm part of their Slack and I see the work that they do. So, and the work that they do is finding, uh, it's real live OSINT finding missing people, like currently missing people. And I think they're the only people who put on a OSINT CTF like yes, publicly. That's correct. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Thank you. And, and we had, uh, just as a disclosure, we had two teams uh, from Southwest Florida SEC that joined. Uh, Joe led a team, and then uh, Justin and I were on a team. That's awesome. How'd you guys do? Uh, Justin and I uh, got one thing rejected and didn't get any other flags, <laughs> but I think Joe did really well. Yeah, That's we all right. 14 submissions, and all of them were accepted. That's awesome. Congratulations. And that was just, what, last week, two weeks ago? Yeah, I think was, right yeah one. about yeah. a week ago. Yeah, honestly, that's the best way to learn OSINT, I think, is to just dive right in. Um, that's kind of how I got started with it, is um, Chris saw me posting a lot about how to support the Innocent Lives Foundation, and we connected on Twitter, and then I started volunteering with them, and I just got thrown into OSINT. I did not know most of it before then. And now I'm leading a team of 20 investigators. So it's, once you have the passion for it, once you make fun out of it, it's, it's absolutely amazing to learn. And it really makes day-to-day -day stuff easier. Um, and, and, and I don't know, if I don't, maybe I forgot if you mentioned it or not, but the, the Trace Labs, the CTF that they just did this past Saturday was ran for six hours and they ran it for missing people. Uh, all, and it was almost all kids this time. Yeah, yeah I'd say over half of them. The last, yeah. the last one they did was uh, mainly adults from all over the world. This one was mainly ch uh, kids that were missing. That's awesome. That's over 500 people. Yeah, I'm really glad they exist because we have a lot of people that want to volunteer with us, but we're very stringent with who we allow to do this work for obvious reasons. We work in a very dark world of child abuse material. Um, but Trace Labs is a big one that we send people to because you can learn a ton of OSINT through them, but you can also make a real life difference. Also, too, I may want to add that they have a, uh, every other week, they have a group okay. of five or six on a Trello board that comes out and that you can go in help them find I did not see people that. yeah so that they have awesome. that and then then they have all the tools too they're building an OVA is specifically just for OSINT and for finding people and they've been working on that project for a while kind of like a Cali but for OSINT specifically right. that's awesome yeah wow um, if you if you're really into podcasts OSINT curious is a great podcast and they seem to really update it with tools all the time um, and new things they have like a weekly podcast yeah exactly thank you well, um, i should have grabbed the link for it right here and they've got great youtube videos as well oh great short 10 minutes uh, yep another thing too the the first book that you have on your list from the buscador guy oh it's a, gr it's a great book 
And I don't know why I skipped over his and went right to Vinny Troyes. Um, he's he's really good, and if you want, it's probably it's the seventh edition. It's the 2019 book that he has, and if you want to build your own OSINT, because I did a final project, and my final project was uh, building an OSINT OVA, and we used his book, and it goes step by step exactly how to build one. And once I did that, then the Trace Lab guys were starting to do their own, so I kind of helped them with doing that as well too. But that book is invaluable. If you want to know? Yeah, the tools, I wish his class was available still. Um, well, I had too many DDoS attacks. Exactly. For those of you who are familiar with this class um, but don't know, his class will be going away. Well, it's already closed if you weren't already registered, but all of his tools and his material will be leaving in August of this year. But his new book is basically his tools and the website put into book form. And I think he even gives you a zip file in there that you can actually download the tools for later uh, use. Yeah, he gives you a blueprint right on the website. But I will tell you this, if you're gonna go build your own, use buy the book because there's things in the book, there's pulls and gets that he didn't include on the, on the website that are in the book. That's just what, a- What's the name of his new book? Uh, it's called IntelliTechniques. It's uh, 2019 and that's hit Michael Bazel. Open source intelligence techniques? Yeah, and it's okay. on uh, Amazon. Yeah, thanks. There's older versions too. Get the newest one. Okay. Here, I'll put, I'll put it in, uh, in the chat for everybody. And he also has a second book about uh, staying private on the internet. Something I don't remember yeah. the title though. Yes, which is an amazing book. So I absolutely recommend picking up that because you'd be surprised what information about yourself is out there as well. Yeah. And then they give you a good checklist to run down. Um, so my last slide is just about a little more about the Innocent Lives Foundation um, and ways that you can support us. We were founded by Chris Hadnagy about two, a little over two years ago. Um, and we are a nonprofit, a registered 501c3. So we are, we all, but me and Shane, who is also on this call, um, we are the paid employees of ILF. Um, aside from that, we have 35, including our board of directors, volunteers. Um, so we, we help law enforcement with both finding and locating child predators or anybody who is exploiting kids on the internet and we hand it over. Yeah. I've gone over that a few times, sorry. Um, so if you want this list and you don't want to screen cap it or take a picture, you can actually just text ILF to 26989 and it will provide you with this list. Um, it gives our LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Shane, can you explain Roundup for me? Um, I'm not as familiar with it as you are. So literally, Today is the first day we've announced the roundups. And so uh, basically, you, if you go there, it gives you the opportunity to make an account. You take a credit card or a debit card, and you uh, plug your information in. I know it sounds really horrible saying this in an OSINT <laughs> training. Trust us. Trust me. No. After so, everything I've just told you. <laughs> Uh, anyway, it does. It, they work directly with the bank, so nothing goes through this. And so what it will do is when you make a charge, it'll take the change that's left over and it'll donate it to us. What I like about that is that it allows me to control um, where I cap it. So A, I've got a full dashboard. I see everything all the time. But if I can only do 10 bucks this month, I just slide it over to 10 bucks. And once I've rounded up $10, it stops doing it. And so you've got really nice control over, over how that works. So, you know, it doesn't take a lot of people donating five or 10 bucks um, a month on change to start making a big difference for an organization. So that, that's why we rolled it out. So literally you guys are the first ones to, to see this. Yeah, so does anyone have any questions? I know feel like I ran through that a little quicker. I, I just have one. Can you post that onion link somewhere? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Also, are you willing to share your slides? Yeah, that would probably be easier um, than posting the link. Uh, let me, I'm going to stop sharing for now. And I will grab you guys that link. Thank you.
I have I'm not sure if, if you know this, but the Have I Been Conned site, I've actually used that for a bit. And for quite a while, I was signed up for getting notifications about um, anything impacting specific domains. But about eight months ago, I stopped getting those. And I tried to write to the actual guy that manages it and never got a response back. So have you seen any recent issues with that site? I have not. Um, I wish I had an answer for that question. They have a really weird, if you go and read the history of the site, they have mm -hmm. a really weird thing going with the people who run the site and the people who breach the information and, and get the hacked information. There's a weird, okay. it's just a weird thing. Just go read about it. It's, there's other sites out there. There's like Hushed and there's a bunch of other sites out there as well too. Uh, different awesome. tools that will search. There's one called H8 Mail. And mm -hmm. now if you put in your, an email address like you do on I've Been Pwned, but it'll go and do hunter.io or do Shodan, all the other ones. And it'll show up a whole list of those. But it's on GitHub. It's at H8 Mail. I have a question. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, I and well, you mentioned volunteer volunteering, and I was wondering if you do other kind. Will you'd accept, or your company would accept other kind of volunteers, such as developers, for example? Um, Absolutely. Um, oh. Yes, we actually have one of our developers on this call right now. Um, oh, <laughs> well. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's something I currently work as a, well, for the Department of Health, but I wanted to do some volunteer work as a developer and I was just, I thought, you know, this is, this would be a great place to start. So if I wanted to volunteer, do I just go to your site and apply or how does that work? Yes, so we actually have a volunteer tab. Let me grab your website. Um, let's see, you can tell us a bit about what you do. Okay. If it wants to load. Let me, I'm going to post it in the chat just to everyone. If you want to apply, there it is. Oh, thank you. And then I'm still getting those slides for everyone. I have not forgotten about that. So, so I do want to toss a little bit of a disclaimer out about if you're wanting to apply to be in the pit, uh, what we're doing right now. So Samantha hinted to it a little earlier. Um, we're looking for folks who do this daily already as a profession and that we just don't have it in our, in our bandwidth right now to train people to get better at OSINT. So we get a lot of folks who are like, oh, I just started learning OSINT and I would love to sharpen my skills. That's awesome. We appreciate it very, very much. But we've got, we're right now, well, we're growing and we're looking to bring people on who can just walk right in, minimal training. Basically, guys, this is how we want you to do it. And here's the legal reasons why we have to do it this way. And then we'll, then we'll see if, if you're fit. Um, you'll go through, just so you know, you'll go through an initial interview. You'll go through a technical interview to see if you have the chops for what we want. Once all that's done, then you'll go through a wellness interview uh, with a trained therapist to see if you have the emotional bandwidth to be able to do this type of work. Uh, it is soul crushing. And the last thing we want to do is, is have anyone else get harmed by going out and doing this type of work. Um, so just, just a little bit of a disclaimer out there that along with the fact that at the moment uh, we're not taking anyone, accepting anyone else into the pit itself. Um, we hope to be able to open that up later in the year, but um, that's, that's kind of where we're at right now with that. And so Desi, to, to your point with the dev work, we're always looking for a good dev person if you got the right tools to, to make the fit for us. Thank you, Shane. Um, I just shared that over with you, Shane. I know I should have had this prepared, but here we are. <laughs> um, so tell me a little more about what you guys, is this a group that meets monthly? Yeah, so we meet monthly, third Tuesday of the month, 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. 
and just uh, discuss a variety of topics uh, in the industry. So and we've typically we've done, in person when not everyone's on quarantine. Right, typically in person, uh, not online, not virtual. Uh, we don't have a live feed going or anything like that. It's um, you know meet up face to face, be physical, and uh, just get to know everyone. And and it's informal. It's just talk about the different topics that people are interested in. Um, bring show and tell. Maybe if somebody's got something they're working on, they want to bring with them. Um, several of us have done our own presentations uh, during last year, and like I said earlier, uh, when we did the intros, uh, since we've started this year, we've had presentations almost every month now. Uh, we've had a presentation from somebody else outside of the group coming in to give us a presentation, which has been really great. That's awesome. Well, thanks for having me. Um, yeah. Another question, <laughs> aka Dark Rose. Shh, we don't talk about that. That was a chapter of my life that I put behind me. Um, so some offset techniques. Um, always use clean socks. And what I mean by this is clean sock accounts. Never reuse them. Um, even with each individual investigation, I recommend it. Uh, if you go to inteltechniques.com, which we were just talking about, he shows you how to set up Buscador, um, which if you're not, I recommend doing it in a virtual environment of some kind. Um, Buscador is by far, I think, the best virtual environment for it. It is, has a lot of OSINT tools built into it, and it's really fun to play with. Um, don't do it on your home machines, for one. You don't want to leave behind a digital footprint, and you don't want to... Gosh, my train of thought just left. So you don't want to leave a digital footprint, but you also don't want to cross-contaminate your investigations. Um, and if you're doing it from your home device and you're, say, signed into your Google account, you'll start getting ad recommendations for the things that you're investigating, which is another source of cross-contamination. Um, so really operational security is don't use, don't reuse SOC accounts. Do it in a virtual environment. And don't use crazy, obscure names that are going to make it easy for your target to be like, this person doesn't exist. Um, so there's a site called thispersondoesnotexist.com, and that is what I go to for all of my stock account profile pictures. It will create a totally fabricated person for you, but I still want to use something like John Smith or like a common name, so they can't go digging and be like, well, there's a gazillion John Smiths, but there's only one, I don't know, insert obscured name here. Um, so you don't want to make it easy for things to trace back to you. And when you say sock, you mean like sock puppet accounts? Yes. Yeah. I like to say clean socks for everything. <laughs> clean sock accounts. Don't use dirty socks. Um, so I hope that helped a little bit. Perfect. Anyone else have any questions? Can when you're doing, you know, the innocent uh, lives, and you're doing that, or you're just help. You're like on Trace Labs. We don't. We're just the middle people. We don't. We're not trying to solve like the missing people cases. We're just getting information and giving it to the police. Is that the same exact thing that you guys are doing on your end, or are you involved on solving the cases as well too? Um. So yes and no. It's definitely. Closing and solving the cases, no, not at all. So if something comes into me from law enforcement, I am going to go and look for every username or email or anything related to that person and build them a profile. Um, but I also wanna look for like characteristics of the person or things that they like or comment on, something that can help an officer's investigation. Um, but I am definitely not interacting with the predators and I am not going out there and kicking down doors or arresting people. And how much of the dark web are you using to find that information? So <laughs> I, w I don't have the exact percentage for it, but honestly, most all my cases have been primarily open web. Um, so there is a lot of open web material that people think is only on the dark web. However, a lot of the times they're hiding in plain sight. So I encourage parents, don't use hashtags like bath yeah. time or all those ones. Anything that can promote 
gymnastics or nudity, just steer clear of those and keep your kids safe. Make sure yeah, you're I, checking I, in with what they look at. I heard that the, you know, they used to use hosting, like bulletproof hosting through the dark web, but they don't do that anymore. They're using like GoDaddy and, you know, Wix and stuff that's, you know, readily available because there's so many people on it that they can hide easily in there. Exactly. Yep. So, Samantha, correct me if I'm wrong, but almost every single case we did last year originated on open web, right? Yes. I mean, we did dive into dark web for some research, but it's all stuff people were finding out there. It's just, it's there. So it's, yeah, it's it, really, it's a very, very sad state. It's a lot of people requesting and training child exploitation on very popular um, websites. Now, you mentioned websites and the open web. Now, how how often are you diving into things like uh, Slack channels and Discord and stuff like that? Are you finding that Don't. there's movement towards that? Uh, yes and no. So right now I'm not kinetic with these guys at all. Um, and that would include joining a Discord channel. Um, so right now I don't do that. I don't join Slack channels, but I definitely see people gravitating towards Discord. Yeah, so, it, it is advertised. So watch your kids' Discord for sure. So, so one point of, of conversation for the ILF is that currently we do not interact with any of these guys. So we're not the same guys that are out there that you see on Facebook who are, are naming and shaming and, and texting. Uh, we've been able to be very, very efficient without having to interact. It's all out there. These guys are already misbehaving. They're already doing the bad stuff. And so we don't have to go talk to them because the moment you start conversing with these people in any format, you begin giving their lawyers a wedge in. And so, uh, so far, we've, we've not had to do any of that. The, the, yeah. there, there is an occasion if local law enforcement ask us to do so and they untie our hands. Heck yeah, but typically, absolutely not. Yeah, I think 82% of Chris Hansen's cases walked free due to improper social engineering. And if you don't know who Chris Hansen is, um, he was a guy who had a very popular reality show that was uh, to catch a predator. So he would use somebody pretending to be a child and would bait these predators to come into the home and then film it. 82% of them walked free. Actually, so I, I actually, didn't... Well, actually, the, actually, the first show that he did was here in Southwest Florida in Fort Myers. Are you serious? Little, I did just, not know that. Just a little tip. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. he's a big part of why I do not support public doxing. Want to know why those guys walked free? Well, they filmed it and they did improper baiting and they wanted to use it as a TV show that it gave the lawyers so much ammo. So I'm not, I'm not down with just posting a pedophile's information on social media that gets nothing done and it could put a kid in danger. Um, if you trigger something in that person, you can erase every digital footprint that they've left behind. Um, so we're very careful how we handle them. Well, there's even a more imminent issue with that too. So let's say if you're a, a typical style vigilante group and you go out and you confront someone and then the police choose not to arrest him because they know they don't have a case. What happens if you're the child that person has access to when they get home? It's a really scary thought. So this is, this is why we take this super careful with you know, not only who we bring in, but also how we behave and being sure that no laws are crossed ever because literally kids' lives are at stake. But yeah. So I'm uh, sorry to end it on a little bit of a heavier note. Um, as a positive point, we have reached over 150 cases turned into law enforcement. Um, I think 50 of those is since January alone. And it's all through the support of volunteers and donations. Um, our supporters like you guys are what keeps us going. So thanks for coming to my talk. Question. Yeah. Do you hear back after you turn in the results? Not always. So what I do is I set a Google alert and I watch all of the government websites and I look for a case that comes up with that name and description. Cool. But they are not obligated. The more we build rapport with them, 
uh, the more likely they are to give us feedback on the case, which we're starting to get to that point. Uh, but they're, they don't owe us anything. Um, so we don't hear back as much as I'd like. And then Shane, you went through, uh, we've talked about this previously, but you went through the steps to actually hire somebody. But you also mentioned to me in uh, previous conversations about the fear of getting somebody applying for a position that potentially could be a, a predator. What do you do to filter out those types of people? That is where that wellness interview comes in. It is actually serving two purposes. It's a, it's a sword that cuts both ways. Uh, we don't want to harm anyone. We want to be sure you can do it. But we're also looking for the people who we think are trying to come in under the radar. And so it's, uh, it, it is a challenge because uh, Micnic, they end up having a few every year is what we've been told that manage to make it through their processes. So um, that's another reason why as a minimum monthly, uh, you're going to be sitting in front of that therapist. So if that therapist, and by the way, one of the things that Chris did early on, which I thought was incredible, let's say, uh, John, for example, that you, that you come on board and, and I know you and I want you there working with us and you're very talented and you're ready to rock and roll. And so you get past both basic interviews that we go through. I hand you off to the wellness person and Chris and I are like, yeah, 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 bring him on, bring him on. And our wellness person goes, nope there's something something not right there's a yellow flag or sometimes there's a red flag and it's really obvious that we're not seeing she wins we gave uh and by the way that's our um we have a part-time employee now and we have starting in march we have a full-time therapist who's just starting as an employee and so um when Thank she you. I'm sorry, May, thank you. Um, when, if sh she has veto rights over everyone in the organization, including Chris and I and the board, if she says someone can't come on or they need a break, we have to listen to her. And that's the way we have the, the program set up intentionally. Did that answer your question? It does. And that, that's great to know that it's actually a two-way test and that you're testing throughout as well. Um, but also it's very, uh, it's good that you're allowing a third party person that you don't have any connection with the person. So they can't social engineer their way right into it. Can't no bias. How do you deal with uh, international law? Uh, if somebody does way. live overseas, et cetera. Yep. A predator is a predator. We will work with the appropriate law enforcement agency to ensure that we're doing our part that this guy gets taken away. So, and I believe, I think it was one of our first annual report. Uh, we had somebody locked away from India, UK, and one other place that I can't remember, but we have had international cases. We handle them the exact same way, except Brazil. with a different agency. Brazil was another Brazil. one. And I think, I think Netherlands is in there somewhere. But one of the things for our operational security, uh, we don't want the, we were just, we were just alerted uh, not long ago about a really big case we had some involvement in. That rarely happens to us. And we didn't get much information other than um, a uh, article that was sent back. But we're never going to publish that and we're never going to put it out there and we're never going to try to tell anyone we were part of that. It's part of our operational security. It's part of keeping us as individuals safe. There are a few of us that are public, um, but the vast majority of us, we're, we're not telling who these people are and who's working for us. So uh, there's, there's a reason for that. It's horrible for marketing. I don't have a story to tell, but it's really, really important for our security. We could all make up stories if it would help. <laughs> Right. With uh, TCM raising $10,000 the other day for leukemia to his Twitch stream, have you considered approaching him? I have. Um, so I, I actually, I think we owe him a phone call. He's definitely somebody I've been wanting. And Shane, if you didn't catch it, it's the Cyber Mentor. 
his hair is pink now. So I saw how much he raised and that is just absolutely phenomenal. We spoke to him a few months ago um, about getting involved. That's just when we were starting to get Twitch kind of organized. And now that we're finally officially on there and registered and we tested it, um, now I'm feeling comfortable going and approaching him again. Look, but, the only thing I can tell you is he is a fan of us and I'm really, really happy about that. And so we will, we will see where it goes, if it goes anywhere. But um, I've talked to him a couple of times, seems like a great guy and you never know. So, What are types of like certifications or things that you're looking for when you are hiring? Is there a specific OSINT uh, cert or experience that you're looking for? Um, I got, I got that one. You thank you. Yeah. I'm like, yes and no. <laughs> the, the short answer is no. I mean, so what's going to happen is if, if you will, when you, when you apply, send in all, all of your social media links and everything you can share with us and your, and your uh, certs and everything. And of course that helps, but we've got folks on here who, who don't have a cert and they can find all kinds of people. They're brilliant. Right. And my life, my prior life, um, working in the corporate world, we'd see guys walk in with certs all, all day long with different things and they couldn't troubleshoot their way out of a paper bag. I, I don't care. You may be good at passing a test, but that doesn't mean you can do the work. And so it's not a, in my mind, it's not a given, but it helps us make an informed decision if you have it. So, so I know that wasn't an exact straight answer, but. Oh, no, was, actually, I like that answer because there's way too many paper certified people out there. Yeah, I'm, I'm not certified and I didn't go to school for this at all. Um, it, it was a lot of it was self-taught. And then as I grew in the InfoSec community, I had great mentors and have great mentors like Chris and some others and it's it's a process but there's not like a set in stone path um, unconventional paths are great paths schools are great paths too um, i'm not bagging them by any means i just don't think it's the only way okay can can you do the work do you have the emotional bandwidth to do the work if you have the skill set do you have the time and is this something that you're passionate about those are fundamental things that that we're looking for and if, if you do make it through and you find and we find that maybe this isn't your cup of tea uh, we we do have other things we could ask you to do without getting into the to the pit sometimes but sometimes we need to go ahead and and ask you to leave i know it sounds hard because it's a volunteer thing but we're limited and so and right now one of the things that we're limited by I don't know if you guys are keeping track of the nonprofit world at all, but uh, most nonprofits are down well over 60% in funding because most people are sending their money to anything related with COVID. And I get it and I'm happy that they are. There's a lot of people doing good work, um, but it is presenting a challenge you know, for a lot of us. So uh, one of the things Samantha touched on was using a virtual desktop infrastructure. We are uh, completely set up on Amazon. Everything is very tightly controlled and all of your work is done in a VDI out on an Amazon uh, desktop. And so between uh, most of our money ends up going to the obvious paying an employee, we've got four now, but an insurance, you know, and all the other that. stuff, yeah, that you have to have to run a business, but, um, wellness, taking care of the therapist, and taking care of the infrastructure on the back end, because it has to be virtualized. If you go and you decide, oh man, that VDI is slow today, or my network's just crap, this just isn't working, and you bounce out, and you start doing some of our research on your personal laptop, we will tell you in the beginning that if you do that, we will hunt you down. It's not to be done outside that virtual desktop environment. It has to be done safely. Yeah, not even only for our protection, but also for your mental protection. Uh, we have tools put in the place to not expose you to raw images. You don't have that outside, and you also will not have any legal protection whatsoever 
So if a law enforcement officer comes and knocks on your door and you are on an abuse website or something with abuse material on that, we cannot protect you. Um, you're outside of our bounds. You're outside of scope. I was just thinking, you know, stuff like that can easily get, you know, put in your cash on your drive. And all of yeah. a sudden now you've got stuff that looks like you're one of the predators then. Exactly. And, and that's why those VDIs are very precisely configured to be sure that that can't happen. And heavily and, monitored. Right. And so the reality is, is, is if that does ever happen, all of those point to our founder, which is Chris Hadnagy. Sorry, and Chris. Yeah, take one for the team, Chris. So, and he is the one who can pick up the phone with the contacts at the appropriate levels of enforcement, law enforcement, and take care of that. I'm not going to be able to. If you're volunteering for us, you're certainly not going to be able to. So, it's uh, it's really important that you have to be able to follow the rules. Yeah, at some point, it seems like it would be an interested, interesting talk, Shane, to talk about infrastructure and how 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 you've set it up, if you can even talk about it, how you've set it up and and how you keep it secured as well, because it's not only about the infrastructure, but uh, you, you have some form of, of the security team there uh, to help keep it secure as well and, and monitor things. Uh, sadly, that talk would probably be about three minutes because... <laughs> There's a lot of things we we just can't talk about. Sure. Yeah, yes. one of our yeah. founding principles is we will never give anything that can educate a predator. Um, so all the OSINT I showed today, that's not the OSINT that I do. Um, I will never show somebody the OSINT that I do and the strings that I use. Um, everything is very proprietary. We So for Jared Fogel, subway guy, right? Um, he is a convicted child... I don't, he had USB keys hidden in his walls and the dogs were able to sniff out the silicone in those USB keys. Yes. Guess what was on the forums for tips of evasion for law enforcement evasion? That like instantly, we don't want that happen. We don't want to make it easier for them to either find abuse material. We don't want to make it easier for them to evade us or law enforcement. They use the same type of dogs in Hawaii. My teacher that I did digital forensics with, he's the head of the CSI and FBI. He also works for the military in the state of Hawaii and they go after child predators. And he showed me a picture of the dog on a, it just happened like a couple of days before. And I was like, well, is that your dog? And he's like, no, it's the dog sniffs the glue that's in the processors. And I was like, I never even heard of that. Which, yep. And he told us the same thing. He said, he told us if we thinking about going into it, you have to have a, a stomach of steel. He said, because you'll have nightmares if you go into that field. So I'm glad to hear that you have somebody to go talk to, like a therapist and stuff like that, because it's no joke. He said it's, and he's seen a lot. He's like, it's stuff that you do not want to see, that you can't unseen. Yeah, since I'm full time, I have to see mine once a week to once every other week. Mm. So it's, it's a mandatory requirement. Even our devs actually have to go see theirs. Um, just not as frequently. So it's once every three months because they're still being exposed to the words and the things that we're reading. And we just want to make sure everyone's protected. Okay, if there's no other questions, thanks, Samantha and Shane yeah, for coming in for the presentation. Really appreciate it and sticking around to answer our questions too. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'll hopefully next time I can get more in depth into things. You do a uh, very good and very gross work. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. It's it's rewarding. The the gross is worth it. I had to talk around and see what we can do as far as a deep dive on on some one of those one or more of those tools at some point. Maybe, maybe just like you said, have a talk just about the, the OSINT framework itself. Yeah, yeah. I, you could spend definitely like over an hour talking about just segments of the OSINT framework. It is phenomenal. It's one of my first learning tools. 
Hey, you all can probably help me remember the there's a an app, a phone app. Uh, you take a picture of a hotel room, and it uploads to to somewhere, and and they can use that as, uh, you know, background comparisons to look for, you know, where was this picture of this child taken, that kind of thing. Yeah, image analysis. Um, I don't have good resources for that. Uh, Nick Ferno, if you can mm -hmm. actually, another shameless plug, Nick Ferno will be back in the United States uh, next February, I think, teaching his OSINT class. And he'll actually teach you how to measure the pixels and shadow distance to find exactly where somebody is based on the angle of the sun and wow. how far away they are from the building. And it is some next level mind blowing OSINT. Mm. Um, I highly recommend his class. Oh, no, there's a, a phone app that's out there now. You take a picture, you know, you know like, this is my room is the app or whatever it's called. Have you guys not heard that one? I yeah, not. Dave, we have, um, and I, I feel have. really bad because I should know the answer to that okay. uh, immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you're right. It, it's brilliant. Uh, it's uh, literally, it's a, uh, it's made for cataloging um, hotel rooms and mm -hmm. public areas, and it's uh, to help with human trafficking. Right. So they end up building this database, and then when you see a picture mm -hmm. online of something that's the nasty they can go back and they can begin searching against the backgrounds of it and look right. for things like art on the windows or mm -hmm. what what's out yeah. the window or traffic things like that. all the curtains yeah, and, then, yeah. and stuff like that it's called yeah. traffic cam but ck so like traffic. Ah, thank you thank you yeah oh, yeah it's, it's interesting that you bring that up too because uh you know for those of us who are local here in naples uh recently in the last couple of months there's been an article about uh, what six or seven local hotels that are being uh, brought to court for uh, not doing anything to stop uh, human trafficking. I missed that because I was distracted by the dark shame. I'm sorry. The, the thing, all, all of this is interrelated, right? And so um, the human trafficking, there's overlay with children, there's overlay with drugs. Um, it, 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 it's just bad. And so one of the things that we've chosen to do is we've just chosen, uh, to try to go deep and not be a mile wide. And so we're just really focusing on the kids and the people that are producing this material and then getting them straight through to law enforcement in a way that law enforcement will take the case. Cause sometimes to be honest with you, it doesn't matter if you really know what's going on. If it's not put together in a way that they can accept and get it through court, everybody just wasted their time. And so um, it's the reality of the world that we live in. So whether I would encourage everyone on this call, if, if, you, if any of this interests you in any way, whether it's us, Trace Labs, whether it's any other group working with human trafficking, if you've got some spare cycles and you've got some time to share, share your knowledge. It doesn't have to be money. There's a lot of good people doing good work. Try to find something that fits for you and then do something with it. In this quarantine time, are you seeing an uptick in this type of stuff? Since we're, we're obviously have yeah. more fishing and other things, I would suspect that this is also going to increase during this time. Wow, good question. There's a bunch of papers out there. Yeah, on it right now. And uh, I'm actually waiting for some stats that I can quote. Um, so we're, we're also very careful when we hand out a statistic, we have to be sure it's research, researched. Well, they had, they had, the, so. they had that guy that exposed himself on zoom to the class of kids. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So had, if um, you need anyone who needs zoom bombing, we're doing a zoom bombing webinar on the 24th at 3 PM, 3 30 Eastern time. Um, Let it'll, me. it's for that reason. Um, same thing with a Jewish school. They had someone hop into their classroom and scream racial slurs at them, and no one could get them out. They had to completely kill the class. Um, and this happens constantly right now. It's insane. Let me... It is uh, April the 24th. It is free, and it is um, 3 p.m. Eastern. So it's that's this Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, 
we are doing it. And Chris Hadnagy is actually the one that's teaching the class. This is our third one. It will likely be the last one. Uh, attendance started out great, and we we're kind of doing this. Um, so if we if we get great attendance on this one, maybe we'll go ahead and and we'll pay to keep up the the webinar license and so forth. But um, it's a good class. The cool thing is he's going to go through 30 minutes of how to secure Zoom and how to lock it down. And then there's 30 minutes of question and answer where people can just ask Chris whatever they want to ask him. And we're getting some good questions that are being tossed in there. And for any anyone who is a teacher or if you run a, a church session of any sort or for any reason you're hosting Zoom, this is a great way to know how to lock down your back end. So I would recommend it. I recommend it to other people that you may know. I've been having a lot of people reach out to me saying that their recovery groups are getting Zoom bombed. Um, so he just, he goes into some great methods in securing it. And I know a lot of us here are probably a bit more technical, but a lot of people aren't and they're being forced into a whole new strange area and it scares them and they have no idea that they can open settings. Um, and it's not any shame to them. It's just nothing that's been exposed to them before. Um, so share it with anyone that you think could benefit from it. Yep, and uh, thanks Mandy for posting the link to the webinar too. So if anybody <laughs> thanks, wants to Mandy. go to it, it's uh, there in the chat. Okay, I'm going to do one more call for any additional questions before we wrap it up here. All right, well, thanks again, Samantha and Shane, yes. for coming in, and hope to see you in the future. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Then anybody else, uh, you're, you're all welcome to stay. I mean, you don't have to go home. You can stay here <laughs> if you're already home. <laughs> most of you are probably already home, right? Uh, that's where we're working from home and whatnot, yeah. Um, so we can stay here and just talk about other subjects. Feel free. Uh, Zoom is open. Like I said, we're usually around from 6.30 to 8.30 at least. Uh, and if we get rolling on anything, we'll stay late too. Hey, Joe, how long have you been doing OSINT? Not that long. Maybe... About eight months. I did a Same. final. Pro I did. A, I went to. I was at a boot camp in Honolulu, uh, and my final project, we did a OSINT and we built an OVA, like I said, using the buscador and following the blueprint from the book. And once we did that, then we did the next Trace Labs event. Uh, me and a couple of my friends that were. Uh, worked on the project together and we came in 41 place and uh, I think there was like 150 people the, the one before this last one and then after that I just got into it and started I was on the slack channel of trace labs and there's a lot of really good people there there's a AK 47 and Joe Joe uh, Joel or Joe Gray that's there and they do a lot of OSINT so they help a lot and point people in the right directions with the tools and everything yeah, Joe taught a couple classes up at Tampa B side, right? Yeah. Yes. He was just up there. And actually the guy, uh, one of the guys from our group here at the B sides in Tampa, he won the event and he didn't know anything about OSIN. I, I, me and him were talking and I pointed him in the right direction. The next thing you know, Mike's like, he won. I was, I thought he was going to be here tonight, but he's not in the group. So. Yep. Uh, another John. Yeah. Another John. I think I remember meeting him at the table, actually, mm -hmm. the winner. Yeah. So I was ever. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say you were talking earlier about not engaging and stuff, but you know, I, I was just recalling. Is this, so one of the podcasts I listen to, and I think several other people here do too, is the Darknet Diaries. And uh, I don't remember what exactly what exact episode it was, but it was the the guy from Detroit that was in the chat rooms and pretending he was a, a child or a girl and having people approach him. Uh, and then one of his um, basically get out of jail things was that 
because uh, he had been arrested previously too for for just hacking in general as the police and then i think eventually maybe the fbi too uh started working with him and asking him to do those things um and i i, I do recall there being several stings up in detroit uh when i used to live up there yeah so we like most groups we started out with that mindset that that's what we were going to go ahead and, and do and um when we were began working with not just local law enforcement but at a federal level um they were like no we're not we're not ready for that and so our goal is to work with law enforcement to be sure a case can stick and so samantha alluded to it that um we're getting a bit more flexibility it's just it takes time and uh, the the other caveat to that is if we're directly asked to do something within a specific scope then we can work within that scope whatever they whatever they choose to give us but um cases primarily the cases we're doing is going to be no contact uh, so on average, what's the time frame from the beginning of a case to when you turn it over and how quickly are you moving through these? I tried to keep it less than three weeks. Oh, wow. um, so yeah, I, I definitely want it done in three weeks or less. Some, sometimes I want things done. I want to turn around that week, depending like if they're, and I'm sorry in advance, if there's a child that's directly involved or under the age of five, I want it done like that day, and I want it into law enforcement immediately. Um, I'm not gonna ask my researchers to damage their physical and mental health to stay up to do the research, no, um, but I definitely do have a time frame. Otherwise, I just, I feel like things will sit too long, and I just can't have that. And, 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 they, and there's too they much grow movement. cold, right? Yeah, that's what I was yeah. just saying, cold, that's a good term. I was thinking movement. There's too much movement, to move it, too much moving around. Yes, there is, especially um, on the internet, things like come and go all the time, and it's not guaranteed that it's archived. Oh, you figured out the Darknet Diaries. That was so perfect. Cool. Hmm. I'm going to go listen to that after this. There was also an article not long ago, and I don't have it at my fingertips, uh, Samantha, maybe you'll remember, but it was the it was the mom who played a 12 or 13 year old girl out on the internet, oh. and it was for a company. Bark, I think. Yeah, Bark. Yeah. Uh, if you would like a a chilling read that gives you an idea of some of the things that's happening out there, uh, that is that is worth the read. It's very sad, but it is worth the read. Yeah, here, let me try to find it. Yeah, I think here it is. This it did should it. Be it. Yeah. Oh, that's about how many views they got. Okay, so they do have a video. That's right, they have a whole video that they did on it. But it was done by BARC, all caps. Uh, they're a parental monitoring group. There is the video. Thank you. You're welcome. And you know, this is one of the things we didn't talk about. We, um, we just posted them, we haven't started marketing them yet. But there's two videos from the ILF. One is advice to parents, and one is to get to know us. So the advice to parents is tough. It's about 15 minutes long. Um, and it just, it just gives you the reality of what it is and some of the things that you're going to face. Uh, the, the subject matter is tough. And then another thing we have coming out, and I'll tell you guys first, um, is that there was a young girl um, who was raped in Kentucky and she um, ended up getting a guilty plea. This guy got 70 years based off of what happened to her. And because she came forward, they were able to show that he had done it to a few other kids. And uh, she is going to 
um, as she's invited out with her parents, obviously she's now 16 uh, and she's talking about her experience. And so um, what we are doing is we are helping her. She's not with the ILF, but we've done a video uh, with her and we're helping her get just some, some placement and start to go out and see if this is something that she thinks she really wants to do with her life. But right now she's going out and she's talking to people about her experience and what she wishes she would have done different. And uh, part of the reality is, is that, I mean, nobody wants to hear from a 50 year old white dude about, you know, no, no kid is going to listen to me. Right. And so when they see someone who is much more in their peer group and is saying, Hey, look, this is what it's like. Don't fool yourself. This is what's happening out there. This is what happened to me. Here's how you can protect yourself. That's a real, that's a huge, powerful statement. So we haven't released those yet, but those are our heading out. And that's about a 30 minute video. And I will tell you, I know her and the first time I saw it, I cried. And so, I mean, it's, um, it's tough, but this is the world our children are living in. And this is the world we're having to parent in. So, yeah. yeah. And as soon as you post those, we'll be sure to reshare them from our end too. Okay. I, and you, you know, you talk about as parents, what we're needing to do to protect our children. I'm sure some of you who've been watching my little square of video up there on the screen have probably seen <laughs> I, my daughter walk back and forth a couple of times to grab things out of the office here. And uh, I mean, that's one of the things we constantly battle every day is uh, when she's playing the online games and whatnot, and uh, just you know, making sure she understands that uh, not to share information, not to use her real name, uh, not to have her picture out there or anything like that. They just use generalities. So. Yeah, Net, Net Smarts um, with a Z at the end, they have amazing resources for different age groups and talking to them about the implications of sexting and how you post a picture, you can never have it taken back. Posting your personal information, what is personal information? But it goes a lot younger too, um, introducing just general safety and you know, don't talk to strangers, but it breaks it down into age groups and games and cartoons that are easier for them and more receptive to them. Yeah, I saw somebody was at uh, Tampa B-Sides, maybe one of you guys who was there as well can remember. There's, uh, there was a booth there, with, and I forget which group they were working with, that had some uh, children's curriculum for talking about privacy on the internet. Uh, That's uh, awesome. Privacy online. Glad to see it more. Yeah. They were doing a really good job, and they're connected with Garfield. Um, yeah, that's the one. I just don't remember what actual group. Somebody want to somebody want to look up um, imcybersafe.org. It's ISC squared that's actually doing the, the Garfield one. Okay, thanks, John. So we were talking about podcasts uh, just a moment ago and the different stories that are out there. And another one I hadn't heard of it before. Uh, I'm currently taking the cyber forensics. Uh, course through edX with RIT and one of the forum members on there posted about it. I haven't given it a listen yet, uh, but it seems interesting to, and, and warranted to mention here too. It's called Hunting Warhead and it's through the CBC Productions, uh, CBC bot Podcasts. Uh, so if you look that up, they've got uh, six episodes from uh, beginning all the way up to sentencing. So I'll be giving that a listen shortly here. Hunting Warhead. Hunting oh, Warhead, so. yeah. Perfect. I'm always on a hunt for new podcasts. I just posted a link to the ISC Squared Center for Cyber Safety and Education. All right, yeah, there it is. Thanks, John. And would you tell me again, what was it that you just, you were just speaking about? I was looking this up. Uh, which one of us, me? Yes, Mike. Uh, so I was talking about the, there's a podcast done by CBC podcast. So can, so it's out of Canada okay. called hunting warhead. Okay. And, um, 
I think this is related to a predator. And it goes all the way from the beginning of the investigation all the way up to sentencing across six episodes. And I was just saying, I was, I'm in the cyber forensics course uh, through RIT and on, on edX. And okay. I just saw it posted on there from one of the other forum members. So I haven't had a chance to listen to it myself, but uh, seems like it might be something interesting. It, yeah, that does. It's kind of like something not even related to the talk tonight, but the um, if you ha if you're interested at all in cyber currency, uh, the podcast "The Missing Crypto Queen" out of the BBC uh, is a really good podcast too. So the Missing Crypto Queen is about the woman who started uh, OneCoin and how it's all a big fraud and they're trying to track her down because she went missing and something at the tune of 15 billion dollars with her yeah wow. so for that amount of money anybody can disappear right yeah well the blockchain got hacked, the blockchain got hacked yesterday for 25 million again oh, really off a of known vulnerability yeah the huge one The uh, same one that happened probably, I think it was like six or seven months ago, and they did the same vulnerability and went in and exploited it, and they took a tune of $25 million out of the Bitcoin. Ish. I'll look it up. You know, one of the issues with OneCoin is the blockchain never existed. Hold on, you mean it never existed? Like <laughs> No. <laughs> no, they they would come out. The company behind it would come out and say, "Oh, we have it. It's it's we're not ready to release it yet. Um, just trust us." And we, we're using proprietary SQL databases to hold everything, which would be no blockchain. It has nothing to do with SQL databases, and <laughs> and yeah, it's it's almost a cult. Uh, the people who were selling it, it became like a, a multi-level marketing scheme. And uh, people just lost lots of money. And the only way they could make their money back was to sell it to other people they know. And yeah, it just kept going down the chain. It's actually crazier than that. It was just one woman. She did the whole thing. She, she, called started, it. she started it, yeah. Yeah, and then she actually faked the whole thing. She drove, what she did is she uh, promoted it to people who were highly into finance, but not into security. And explained what the blockchain was to them, but left it wide open so that people thought they were using blockchain when they were really just using open protocols. And she kind of combined a pyramid scheme along with, with uh, Bitcoin all in one and then just disappeared with a ton of the money. So you're telling me somebody faked the cryptocurrency? Yeah. <laughs> Not just That's faked awesome. the cryptocurrency, but got the finance people to promote it. So... It wasn't that they were hearing that this one lady was promoting it. They had other people in the industry promoting use this one coin and all these finance people are, are getting together and sharing their stocks and saying, okay, let's do this with this one coin because it was promoted within them. And then she just up and left one day and closed it all down and it was all wide open. It all went into her account anyway. Yeah, and they, and they market it towards people who, oh, you missed out on the big Bitcoin explosion. Get in on the ground floor of one coin. It's going to be even bigger. It's going to, you know, just, it's, going to, it's worth this much. And then when they ran out of one coin, then they expanded, oh, we can add more into it. And uh, here, you can buy more. We haven't run out yet. Ponzi scheme. <sighs> no, it's a good listen. Yeah, there's a, quite a few podcasts about it, um, but they cover a very small piece. Uh, the BBC has like a 10 episode one, so I'll link that. And they actually travel around, so they, they get tips and whatnot, or they find stuff online, and they try, they try and chase it down, just trying to, to locate this woman. And uh, so far, they haven't been able to find her. It's one hell of a story. And scheme. Yep. Yep. Thanks, John. He posted it to the the podcast is listed there in chat. 
We have so much to listen to after this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now this chat will go away, right? When we close. Yeah, I don't know if the chat's captured as part of the recording or not. So I'll have to go back and just oh. copy and paste the whole thing. All right. Well, guys, I got to run. I haven't had dinner yet. So thank you very much for inviting us and allowing us to be part of this. It's awesome. Yeah, and thanks for coming out anytime. You need food. Thank you. Yes, Make thank sure. you guys for having us. Um, thank you. Are you doing another one next? Do you think you'll do Zoom for the next one? Like Likely. if you're doing an, if you're doing another one. Yeah, I mean if if we're still having to to not if we can't be we're physically still, still we'll if be we're doing still a, all on house arrest. Right. So we'll be doing another Zoom link next month, and that'll be it's a good reminder just to plug the dates. Uh, third so Tuesday of the month. Third Tuesday of the month is the nineteenth, so May nineteenth at six thirty. Uh, we'll be posting it up beforehand. We'll we'll send out advertising or marketing or we'll hype it up, whatever. And uh, so you'll see it on, tw on Twitter feed or uh, Facebook, awesome. uh, like LinkedIn, Instagram. I don't do much on Instagram. I, I need to find just a stock photo and then just use that and then post a blurb or something. Uh, but then on our website, it usually gets updated with at least the date. The link never goes out on the website. Um, and then, of course, we've got our Slack channel, which I think you're on now. So uh, you'll see that pop up in the Slack channel, too. Sweet. I'll keep an eye out for it. Try and to anybody, keep an open line of communication a bit. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, anybody else here uh, that's that's not part of uh, Southwest Florida Sec Slack channel uh, and want to be invited, uh, we're open to any invites. You don't have to be in Southwest Florida. You don't have to be in Florida. Uh, just shoot me an email. Uh, you can hit me up at uh, Southwest Florida Sec at protonmail.com or SWFL, sorry, SWFL Sec, S-E-C, at protonmail.com. And I'll get an invite out to y'all. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks again for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for hanging out with us afterwards too. Bye.